Welcome to Arcade Attack. Player one, please press start. Gentlemen, start your engines. Player two has now entered the game. Player 3, choose your weapon. back for another Arcade Attack episode, so thank you for tuning in, listeners. I'm joined, as ever, with my trusty Lieutenant Dylan. Hello, listeners. Hello, Lieutenant Dylan. Lieutenant <laughs> Dylan. Yeah. Uh, we've got Keith as well. Just Keith, not like Sergeant Keith. No. <laughs> <laughs> Keith. You're a civilian. Field Marshal Barlow. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and, uh, and our special guest is back for another week, good old Rob. Hey, and now the podcast has turned 21, anything goes. <laughs> anything yeah. goes. It's fully legal. Anything, anything goes. In any country, not just UK. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Right. Dreamcast games. We, we like them. They're nice. We like yeah, we like Dreamcast games. games. What, what's, who can name me some rare slash valuable Dreamcast games? Anyone, anyone to chuck any of your ideas? I can name a couple yeah, that I know it. of. Ikaruga, that's quite rare. Never heard of it. Just to shoot 'em up. Um it's kind of like a follow on from Radiant Silver Gun, which was on Saturn. Um and it's it's kind of weird. It's it's a, like a vertical shooting get shoot 'em up game and your ship you can switch the colour of your ship okay. and you have we have white I don't know if they call it light and dark or white and black. We have white enemies and black enemies and white bullets and black bullets and you can switch the colour of your ship between the two. Wow. And you do so while your ship is white the dark, the black bullets don't do you any harm. Wow, that's interesting. And vice versa. And they, you cause more damage depending on which colour. So you have, it's kind of really tactical, so as well as constantly dodging enemies, you're switching between the two. It's quite hard work, but it's quite fun. I've played it in the arcade. Oh, nice. But that's I quite think, rare. Yeah. That's quite and rare. I think Keith gets kudos for actually saying vice versa rather than vice versa. Vice versa? Yeah. Who said vice versa? It's because I can say speak it all English. the time. Man. Vice versa. Yeah, so well done, Keith. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Kudos points. Well done. <laughs> I don't know any Ray Dreamcast games. Sorry, man. Well, the game that <laughs> good old Keith described does sound pretty interesting. Do you, do you know one? You just, uh, no, I don't. No, I, I thought you were about to. No, I thought what, we thought I was just going to dig something out. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was trying to get Daytona on it for it the other day, but that was only like thirty quid. I wouldn't yeah, say it's that not was super rare. rare. It's not super rare, is it? Do you? Well, apparently, there was like a space. You know, Space Channel Five. Have you seen the original Space Channel Five on Dreamcast? No. It's kind of a weird rhythm game. Oh, okay, but I'll there was out, like a bro. Space Channel Five Part Two Limited Edition, which apparently is really rare. Oh. that's expensive. There you go. Then there you go. There's two. Arguably, though, the rarest slash, slash most valuable uh, Dreamcast game is actually quite a common game that a lot of people would have heard of, would, would have played what? on the PC what? and even the PS2. I'm talking Half Life. What? <laughs> there was a Dreamcast version of Half Life. What? <laughs> well, Are you serious, Adrian? <laughs> I am being serious. The story goes that 
the game was developed on the Dreamcast. It's, it had already been released on, the, on on the PCs. Huge game. It was fully complete. And just before production was about to begin, taken away. Okay, I think wow. Sega and Valve fell out about some arguments, some lawsuits, and the game was pulled. No. A few, a few American games, I believe, the American versions are available. They they were they they got released, and I'm talking very few. I'm talking thousands. I think they're going for thousands of pounds these days. It's absolutely mm. incredible. If you can see a copy, you, you've done well. Wow. Well, we're, 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 we're unlikely existed. to see one in the wild. Well, oh. I, never, I, I had a... We go on eBay now and then, don't we? We check out what's going on. It's true, yeah. yeah. We do. We like to check out what's <laughs> yeah. going on. And I thought to myself, because I, I, I was thinking I want to do a bit of a Half-Life podcast. I think I just type in Dreamcast Half-Life. See what comes up. And guess what I saw for £10? Ten pounds? No. I saw a copy of Half Life on the Dreamcast. Oh my god, it's here! Oh my god! Wow! <laughs> no. Oh my god, I can't believe it! It's right here in my house. Wow! But I, are you ready to? This is not, call me an idiot. Are you ready to be disappointed? This <laughs> is it. A this copy? is not a genuine <laughs> copy. No, no, I can tell you that. I, no, it's not. I, I went on eBay and I thought, oh, someone's put this on. Someone's put this on. Like a buy it now, ten pounds. <laughs> keeps opening it up it looks dodgy oh. and I, without even thinking yeah yeah there's kind of motion you don't even think oh, oh. so I must put this on a second ago I'm going to buy it now and all of a sudden I thought no what have I done I've done a bit more, a bit more research I obviously bought it's, not, it's an obvious copy isn't it it is very it's ridiculous oh. so you yeah. could argue £10 wasted but does it work does it, it does, work though? it does work Mm. So it is, so it's not ten pounds wasted. It's, it's not a it's game not, out of it's it. It's not the original one, but <laughs> it's. I thought, oh, you really had me going. I did, didn't I? Oh, I was, I was like, yanking your chain for a bit. Oh then. man! Um, well, even just looking at it is pretty amazing. It's. A, I might have to put a picture on Twitter. You about... should stick that on eBay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can I borrow it? You can borrow it. You can try yeah, it out. Yeah, I'm going to borrow it. Um, Look, it was a silly mistake. I had a bit of a blonde moment, not even thinking. <laughs> and I think it's the only American version of Dreamcast, and they're very few and far between. But obviously, some they, they've got hold of the actual um, the ROM, the actual sort of yeah, how data, yeah. and they, they can now burn it onto Dreamcast. So it's, it is available. yeah, you can actually enjoy it on Dreamcast. Is that, I, I think it's worth you know you pay ten quid for it. I think it's worth more than ten wow. quid. Yeah, but but already I own it on the PS2 and the PC. So that was, oh. was that a waste of money. Yeah. Mm. Well, <laughs> the Dreamcast version might be better. Uh, it might be, and actually, mm. actually, I'll come Better to later. PC version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you could argue that there's something in the Dreamcast version that's quite interesting. I'll come to that later. So today's pod, guys, I want to talk about Half Life. It's a game that I, I would, I would probably argue. You could make a good argument that it's the best first-person shooter ever made at the time. Okay, it, it absolutely incredible game. It's a game that I remember buying, uh, buying and playing on the PC many, many years ago, and it, it blew my mind. It really did blow my mind. How many PC Game of the Year awards do you think Half Life won back in 1998? Most of them. It, it did win most <laughs> of them. It did win most of them, truthfully. So in 1998, so that's 99, it was heralded as an amazing game. It, it, do you want to have a guess? Uh, 11. More than 11. 12. More than 12. <laughs> 30. 50. Huh? More, 50 over, over 50 over 50 over uh, 50 PC Game of the Year awards it is considered one of the best video games of all time and actually I like this I, I, I've stolen this little quote from IGN they basically said that the history of the first person shooter genre can be broken down very simply uh, pre Half-Life and past uh, and post Half-Life games wow. so pre Half-Life I'm talking uh, the, the original Dooms Wolfenstein Wolfenstein yeah. Junior Can Freely yeah. Quake yeah. Quake the, the first Quake you know great games and I, I did an episode on um, Duke 3D you know how much I like that game yeah. but this game Half-Life just took things forward it took it, it took that genre and added a story to it it added a bit more sophistication to it and I, I, I've been playing it just today I've been playing it recently again to get back into it it, it, it plays as well now as it did those many many years ago 1998 it is widely widely regarded as the best PC game ever hmm. yeah, now that, that's really? a, honestly it's a massive claim wow. it, it, but you could almost argue it's the game that really got a lot of people into PC gaming you know it's it's ridiculously popular game but it launched Valve didn't it really you know what 
I, I was going to come into that. It was a Valve's first ever game. Hmm. They never released a game before that. It's their debut title. Hmm. And I was thinking to myself, is there any developer that has released a better debut game than, than Half-Life? Yeah, the greatest game. PC game of all time. Yeah. Oh, similar theme. What? Bungie? Any... Was, was, was their first game Halo? Am I, am I going mad? Maybe. Or did they? They probably did stuff before that, actually. Maybe. It's the first game of no. But yeah, I don't know. Debut, yeah. I can't think of any other debut. So, didn't, because I read the Wikipedia page of Half Life, because I've never played it. Right. So I read the Wikipedia page ahead of uh, the podcast. Didn't they use the Quake engine for the That's game? Right. They did. They took the original Quake engine and they added stuff to it and they just pushed it onto another level. But yeah, they did. So they, they altered this Quake engine a lot, but they, that was the original kind of thing they're working with. So, look, I, I like Quake. I, I think it's a good game, but there wasn't much story to it. I like Doom. Not loads mm. of story, even Duke Nukem what? 3D. The, well, what, Doom has man. a great story. You're a space <laughs> marine, kill the bad guys. Oh, yep. Space, space marine. Help. Space yeah, Marine no. loses his love in all the demons and then he has to fight the demons <laughs> and then he raises love. Well, not really, that's not really the story. It's just love. He's making sure people are listening. Are you paying attention? Are you paying attention? <laughs> well, look, Half-Life is, is strongly praised, or was at the time strongly praised for its high graphics, innovative gameplay and a, a very involving storytelling. And I'll come to that later, but it's very unique in, in, at the time about how they stole the story. I told you it was released in 1998. The exact date was November the 19th, if you want the exact date. But actually, it could have, it could have been released a year before. Apparently, Valve were working this game for a number of, you know, a good, good year or two uh, before it was released. And that they were almost ready to release it in 1997. But they basically said, it's not quite good enough. We need to start from scratch and really push out this game to the next level. So imagine if they released a sort of half-hearted Half-Life excuse the very dodgy pun there, a year before. It would never have the same impact as it did now. So it just shows you Valve. You know, they, they took a, they must have taken a bit of a hit with the money, maybe, not to put the game up earlier. But fair play to them. A great, a great decision. How many copies have been sold of Half-Life, would you estimate? <coughs> Most of them. Well, of course. The <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I've only got Somehow. numbers up to 2008, which is a bit weird. Is bit it random. across all platforms, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> That's a tough one. One million. <laughs> one, one billion copies. <laughs> well, I swear we do that at least once a podcast. I think it's around. <laughs> yeah, we do that. Yeah. That, <laughs> that joke never gets sold. It's roughly around sort of ten million copies by two thousand and eight. So big, big, big game. Damn. It was like I said, ported to the PS two in two thousand and one, and it was it, it was finally followed up with a sequel in two thousand and four, Half Life two. Half Life two is amazing. I will not talk too much about Half-Life 2 today. I might save that for a future pod. I think it deserves it. But but Half-Life 1 did spawn a few se- uh, did spawn the sequel and there's been lots of debates about the third one. We can talk about that again in the future. Yeah, it is it was the fir- the highest ever uh, far- highest ever selling first person shooter of all time until what game? What game took the mantle? It's, I'll give you a little clue in 2011. Call of Duty. Boom, correct. Nice. That was well done, Keith. That was the game that took over. Before that, Half Life was the biggest selling first yeah. person shooter. And like like uh, Rob was saying, its its engine is heavily modified version of the Quake engine uh, license from our friends at, at, at ID Software. So, what other games were using that kind of mechanism at the time? Uh, obviously, Quake at the time. I know, obviously, Duke Nukem 3D was a similar sort of build engine, but mm. Quake was the one they were really sort of pushing the boat out. Um, do you know who who's the main guy in Half Life? Who do you actually control? I didn't know his first Gordon name. Gordon Freeman. Well done, Doctor. Rob's memorised Gordon that Freeman. <laughs> no, I actually knew that. It's I knew his name was Gordon. <laughs> He's not your typical um, all action guns blazing shoot 'em up kind of action hero. He's different, isn't he? He's not a Duke Nukem. He's not a space marine, you know, from Doom. He is a doctor. He's a doctor. He's an educated man. He looks a bit like Frankie Boyle. He looks a bit like Frankie Paul. <laughs> he does a little bit. He's um... no. He looks. I'll tell you what he looks like. He looks like the Damon Hill on the cover of his new book. Does yeah, he? what Damon Hill with his goatee? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Damon Hill loves a goatee now. He looks exactly like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll save a little. I'll, I'll give you a little fact already. But do you know what? You wouldn't like looking at the cover, but good old Doctor Gordon Freeman does actually have a ponytail. It's you can. <laughs> 
What? He's got a little place in the 90s. It's, it's the 90s, Keith. I don't think it's Frankie the late Boyle. 90s, though. Yeah. I don't late think 90s. Frankie Boyle has a, has a ponytail. You, you can see he's got a ponytail. He doesn't look like he has a ponytail. Well, th- it's like at, he's got a short back and sides. You're looking at a dodgy dream I'm looking, copy, to yeah. be fair. But yeah, <laughs> it, apparent, well, you can, I'll explain how you can see the, the, the ponytail later. All right. Gameplay. The gameplay is absolutely incredible. It is so fluid. I remember playing it back in the late 90s and just being blown away how crisp the game looked, how easy it was to manoeuvre. It was so sort of, the controls are incredible. If you point your gun wherever you wanted to, such really top, top gameplay. Mm. I, I, it, it basically, you know, Doom was a little bit clunky, you know, left and right, you know, and Duke Nukem was good. You could sort of put your gun wherever you wanted with the mouse, but this took it to another level. It's so crisp. So, so crisp. And actually, the game follows the perils of Dr. Gordon Freeman and he must overcome an interdimensional alien uh, invasion after a teleportation experiment goes disastrously wrong. (laughs) It's it's great. And when you first start the game, you guys know this, don't you? Where where do you first start the game? You're in the facility. You're going down. Before you get in the facility, what are you on? On the little train thing. The train. Oh, so you are, you are in the facility. Yeah. Black, Black Mesa. Black Mesa. Yeah. Mm. And you're, you're actually late for work. Oh, no. A bit late for work. Oh, good, old, good old Dr. Freeman running late for work. He's getting the train. Um, and the, it must be about five, ten minutes. But in this train, you can't really do much. But what, what you're doing is you can walk around, you can sort of practice your keys, I can jump here, duck here. But you're stuck in this little train and you, you go through the actual uh, the facility that it's a bit like Area 51 I think it's sort of based on this kind of scientific uh, huge building a little bit secretive and it you see you go through different levels which actually are different people and, and, and you see different sort of vehicles in the background moving around doing little jobs you can tell you're in a sort of space age kind of scientific proper high tech area and it's beautiful you know you, you just what I like about it it's is it's gorgeous to look at when you're in the train and you're looking yeah. at and but looking through the yeah, it's the one of like I think we yeah, it's one of the all time great like iconic kind of yeah. parts Stops of gaming. Game. But because you know I've only played it, do you actually go to those areas later on? You do. Say? Some of those areas you will actually turn up in the future, and it's it's, it's absolutely amazing. And I, what I like about it is, and I think this is really clever. And I, I might be wrong, but I think this is the first game that did this. There is no cutscenes in this game, no cutscenes. Hmm. So. There's a huge story so as, as well. play it through, yeah. How can a game with such a good story, which I'll talk about later, mm. have no cutscenes? How would you think? This is a really ambitious idea, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but basically, the, the cutscenes are such, or when the story sort of moves on, you're, you're actually physically controlling Gordon. So you're walking yeah. around. You have to look at people. You to look hear at them. people. And if you walk too far away, you, just, you can't hear what yeah. you're saying. It's quieter. <laughs> yeah. And I was thinking just recently, I don't think anyone's played Half-Life um, exactly like anyone else ever in the world, because... Even little things about you, you see different angles, do you understand? You walk around, you're seeing different angles, different things going on. And when things are happening in the background, it's, it's how you are viewing it by mm. moving the, the mouse and the keyboard. I, I really, really thought it was quite incredible. There are, like I said, there are scripted sequences. If you get to do certain tasks or you press certain buttons, things will happen. But like I said earlier, you can see those things happen how you want to see it. You can run around and just keep watching forward. It is great. And what, what's so good about it, and because there's no cutscenes, there's also no official levels as well. So you're mm. playing the game from start to finish, and there's oh, no okay. clear, you've completed level one, well done. Mm. Do it's it? just the whole story. The whole story yeah. from start to okay, finish. Yeah, yeah. There are little bits of little text that comes up going, you know, what, te- it explains where you are, mm. but it's simple, and it, the text goes away, it just blend, blends away really nicely. And I did mention it, guys, but the whole screen is, is basically, <clears> you, there's no kind of, additional side bits to the screen there's a little mm. uh, it, it tells you your bullets it tells you your health your armour mm. you, what gun you've got but that's about that's it. it the yeah. whole screen is open up you really think you, you are the Dr Gordon Freeman controlling uh, this character absolutely absolutely incredible um, there are you know when you kind of got through to a sort of another level another sort of chapter when it, when it says, it says loading so it, it, oh, okay. it loads but that gives you a little you, I kind of like those bits though because it saves and if you die yeah. you go back to that sort of save point mm. so it's kind of like a checkpoint but not really so you kind of know as you progress oh, I've got to another certain bit before Half-Life first person first person, shoot, uh, first person shooters even were literally what they said in the tin you went around shooting bad guys yeah <laughs> what Half-Life took, I think, to another level was the puzzle elements. You know, there's 
jumping puzzles. There's little bits here we have to open up and turn on different buttons and switches. And it's it, the, the mechanics, the physics of the game are incredible. I don't know who worked on the game, but they deserve a lot of praise. They, they took the original first person shooter and, and almost added another genre to it, another sort of platforming genre to it. And it worked really, really well. It was new at the time. Well, it's like for, for any, um, any kind of genre to evolve. Yeah, you know, you have to bring more to it, and so they brought like the puzzle element and that's right. the story element, like you said. So it's and just like an evolution of the first-person shooter. It really, that's why it's such an important, important game. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's one bit where you can turn on a steam valve and it can kill, you can spray uh, hot steam at, at enemies. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you can't just, you can kill enemies not just with your weapons. There's other ways as well. Mm -hmm. Really, really good. There are some bosses as well, kind of conventional bosses. Um, they're, they're pretty good as well and that kind of defines kind of the end of the chapter um, what kind of bosses are we talking considering it's an interdimensional invasion <laughs> well I'll come to the exact plot in a bit more detail later but most of the bosses well I think pretty much all the bosses really are uh, maybe apart from one one of them truthfully is, is aliens huge aliens and I'm, I'll come to those later that's right Rob but it's, it's yep. quite interesting um, jump in later on you pick up I should have mentioned actually, guys, when you get off the train, you're running late. <clears throat> and luckily for you, you've got a good old mate there, security guard, who takes you in, it's all gone, you're running late, better get down quickly. And the first sort of five, 15 minutes, you're just walking around this kind of scientific area. No, no, no killing, you haven't got any weapons. You're walking around, you go into your locker room, you open your locker, and you see your HEV suit, which is basically a radioactive suit, and it looks pretty cool. It, it just gives you a bit more armour as well. And then eventually... Um, you go down to, to, to this experiment. Are you ready for this, guys? So you, I'll give you a bit more depth about the plot, if that's all right. You arrive late for work at 8.47. No, what time are you supposed to be at? Well, we don't know, I don't think. But he arrives late at 8.47 at the Black Mesa Research <laughs> Facility. Obviously, <clears throat> good old Gordon, he's a smart cookie. He uses the advanced uh, train system to get through the facility as quick as possible and get to where he has to be. He arrives at the lab... He's informed by the security officer that, this is, that the scientists have a special experiment going today. You better be quick. You don't, mm -hmm. don't want to miss it. And you have to walk around, talk to the different scientists, work out where you have to go. Uh, quite a few of them are quite snappy. You've actually like, go on, I haven't got time to speak. and Go <laughs> this way. But eventually they say, you must go this way. And they point you in the right direction. You get into your locker room, like I said before. Um, you then go down to the lower levels, find the lab. And you are instructed, basically, it's quite a tough job, actually. You're instructed to enter this huge sort of chamber. And I think it's to do with, um, you've got to push this specimen. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Yeah, you push the thing into the middle of the... Into the beam. Into the I beam. think it's, it's like a, a, a portal, well, it's, basically. It's like a trolley. Something on a trolley, isn't it? You have to actually yeah. physically push the, mm. the trolley into the beam. And unfortunately, uh, as soon as this specimen enters the beam, uh, there's a huge explosion. And again... You'd think when there's an explosion, it might just be a cutscene, but you physically have to run around and make sure you dodge the fires. And then... So really, Gordon's caused that whole thing? Yeah, he did. And he caused this <laughs> portal to open up between Earth and a dimension called <laughs> Zen. An alien <laughs> planet. And this portal... And God, it's so incredible. When you first... When you first open this beam and put this specimen into the beam, you're, you're transported to Zen. This, I'll come to it later, this planet Zen. And you can physically walk around the planet only for about 30 seconds. So you see all these aliens around you. And they're looking at you going, who is this crazy guy? And you're thinking, where have I gone? Then this little, you go into another area of the, of the, of the uh, planet and eventually you come back to where, where, where you came from. And the whole lab is on fire. You know, there have been earthquakes and explosions. And you, you get out of there quickly. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, it goes black, lots of flashing, and then you finally, you finally wake up, um, and like I said, you're in ruins, and you, you, you quickly jump out of the, the lab, and you see lots of scientists on the floor, unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot died, unfortunately, and you very quickly pick up the good old crowbar, the infamous crowbar, which is very, very useful. Throughout the, throughout the levels, you, you, you find survivors, some of them will follow you. You can actually talk to survivors, you can talk to scientists, and the security guards, and they follow you. They say, oh, I'll come with you. Yes, I'll follow me. And if you, if you bring a security guard with you, and you come across any bad guys, what do they do? They help you out. They help you out. They, they help shoot the bad guys. Um, 
the first aliens you come across these little kind of almost like face hugger things like yeah, fat like little they're crawling on the ground yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're, pew, pew, pew. yeah they're quite cool they jump around they're quite pew, hard pew, to shoot pew, they're pew. like things in House of the Dead yeah, yeah those little gr- they're exactly like these things in pew, House pew. of the Dead exactly it is great and as you go forwards you pick up the hand, the pistol then you pick up the shotgun and guys what I like about it is yes you have to fight aliens and just, about pretty about an hour into the game you come across soldiers that's good right they yeah they come to them. help yeah save uh, the day no 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 oh. these soldiers have been given the clear instructions that no one has to know about this this incident oh, <laughs> we need to wipe out everything okay. aliens humans included so any scientists oh wow you, you can cannon fodder they want to kill you um, so actually that's why I think the game is so clever there's n- humans your enemy alongside the aliens it's so great and obviously different skills uh, to attack each of those uh, types of enemies um yeah, I mean, like I said, guys, you travel to... Basically, you need to get out of this facility. That is the whole point. You need to get out of this facility. Uh, lots of lots of hurdles. You've got to set up a rocket as well. There's a little train, a little, little train you've got to get on later as well, which is really cool. Uh, you have to use an age railroad system to, to get to this uh, launch pad. The Black Ops soldiers are pretty tough, actually, but, but as you kill them, you can get their weapons. It is absolutely, absolutely incredible game. Um, guys... This is the best bit, though. You 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 get to this war zone area where where it's all, all hell is broken loose and the aliens are t- attacking the the black ops and you kind of sneak through as best you can. And uh, there's airstrikes going on as well. And eventually, eventually, you 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 think the game would have finished it, but you get the opportunity to to you have to actually go to Zen to uh, to kill the alien boss. You have to complete your mission and kill Zen. It's absolutely great, and there's still about a third. Of the game left. Hmm. Um, really, really cool. Really cool. What's the alien boss like? The final one. The well, I, I guess in the Zen dimension. Yeah, is Zen the, dimension. The Zen dimension, the planet, wherever it is, there is one final boss. Is um, it Zul? <laughs> is it, is it Zul? <laughs> Was it Zul, Zul from the Zen from dimension? The Zen dimension. <laughs> I, I'm trying to find the name of it now. I can't. I'll come back to that in a minute. There is no Dana. Already <laughs> Zul. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, the final boss, and I, ha- I completed it once as a kid. It's a tough game, actually. It's a tough game. And you, you, you come across, uh, you're in this massive cave, and you fight this massive, huge beast. I think it's called a uh, Nihili Lamp. Nihili Lamp. And it's oh, a, yeah. It's, it's an ugly looking planet. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm familiar oh, yeah. with it. It's really love crafting. Nihili Lamp. <laughs> and you, you have to shoot different things coming down it's this huge kind of this is almost like an overgrown sort of baby thing I, I, I yeah. baby, baby thing that kind, kind of floats in the air it's, it's absolutely disgusting it sounds really Lovecraftian yeah <laughs> it's true once you finally kill this boss uh, and, and there's a big explosion and you get knocked unconscious when you finally wake up you, you, you've you been stripped to your weapons and you find standing in front of you the G-Man G-Man? G-Man G-Man. The G-Man. And it's this, this gentleman uh, with a sort of grey sort of skin and hollow eyes. This human. Um, and he's been, apparently he's been watching over Gordon throughout. He's been watching you. And what, what do you reckon the G stands for in G-Man? Where was he watching him from? Well, that's a good question. I don't know, actually. Is he like the cigarette smoking man in the X-Files? He's a mystery. X-Files. Gangster man? He's just always watching. Well, w- I Gangster think. Man. The okay. government man. Like G-Funk. <laughs> Keith's got it. The government man. Okay, this mm. big... This big man who's overseeing everything, he's been watching you carefully, and he comes back in the future Half-Life games, he comes back in the spin-off episodes and so forth in the future, he's, he's a creepy looking guy. There's lots of debates whether he's human or not, we're not totally sure, he might be some sort of alien himself, but he, he basically uh, gives you a choice at the end, he, he, he basically says, um, you can eat, yeah, you're on the train again basically, that's how, how you start the game, how you finish the game, exactly. you're on the train again, he says, you can either work with me, or you can die. No. And, and if, if, to work with me, you have to you have to leave the train. And once you leave the train, that's that's it. You, apparently, I think the, the game soon says you've been hired by the G-Man, and it's sort of game over. And it's absolutely incredible. I, I what, what, you what would you do? What if you say screw you, you, G-Man? So if you say no, I I know what happens. Well, if you, I, I do, no yeah, if you refuse, if you refuse, what happens? You remember? Yeah, I think it's something very similar to what happens at the end of Halo Reach. Explain. 
Um, so firstly, correction, Bungie were actually in existence since 91. So Halo wasn't <laughs> <way off. laughs> So that was, <clears throat> I just um, magically found that out whilst you were talking. Anyway, um, yeah, the, the, the end of Halo Reach is mm. you, save, you save everyone and then you're stuck on the planet helpless against hordes and hordes of aliens and they kill you. Mm. Oh, but uh, that is one of the best endings to a game ever. And I don't know... Half-Life is the same. If you refuse, you're teleported to an area full of enemies and I think it's impossible to kill them all. They'll just keep coming. They're just and, keep, and and I, think, yeah. I think Halo Reach ripped that off. <laughs> so well, it sounds like it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think they did. Um... The enemies, I like the enemies in this game. The 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 the, the aliens were the little sort of face huggers called head crabs, and they're cool. They're quite hard to They're fast. They're quick. <laughs> they jump around. You used to be quite good at the aliens. Yeah, they're called head crabs. Why why do you think they're called head crabs? Because they've got another element to them. Actually, what are they aiming for? What are they trying to do? Yeah. Get your brain. They're looking yeah. to jump on humans' heads and at- attach themselves to humans. Uh, and implant their embryos, and if they they attach on the human's head, you, they almost control humans like a zombie. Crab yeah? people, crab <laughs> people. exactly. <laughs> and these are called head crab zombies. <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> no, it sounds like they ripped it off from DC. I think. Okay. Yeah. Everyone's like, ripping off each other. Get, yeah. Get, get, tell, no tell, me truly, ideas, tell me a truly, tell me, tell me a truly like, original idea, yeah. and I'll tell you a lie. The whole brother eye storyline, like where this okay. kind of evil computer. I think it's an evil computer. It was a long time since I read this. Like, decides to, or was it the Omax or something? I don't know. It was a long time ago. <laughs> Basically, like he kind of implants these robot spider things on people's faces, and they're like yeah. zombies. Okay. And they're all ripping off each other. But yeah. other aliens you come across, there's, there's something called a, a Vortigaunt, and these are tall, quite tall alien creatures from Zen, and they've got a big, but they're brown, brown aliens with large orange eyes. And actually, they're they're hostile in this game. But in some future Half-Life uh, games and spin-offs, some of them are quite nice, actually. I've been a little bit like Another World Aliens. There's some good and bad ones no. of these. And one just of, like people. Just like <laughs> people. One, one of my favourite enemies is the, the Gonarchs. The Gonarchs. The Gonarchs, even. And basically, apparently, a developer at Valve asked, why don't you just put a giant testicle on a 20-foot-tall armoured spider? <laughs> <laughs> these things are great. Um, they're, they're huge. They're like walking spiders and huge legs. And I just remember, it's not, it's not really in Half-Life, but in Half-Life 2, I think Episode 2, uh, this little add-on pack, you basically have to run around in this Jeep and shoot loads of these, these going off. So you kind of want to hurt them, but you kind of don't at the same They're time. They're kind of isn't cool. It? Um, isn't it? Oh, right, yeah. I get, <laughs> I get it now. Right. And like I said, guys, there's also humans after you, Marines. They're, they're pretty hard, they're pretty heavy guys as well. Um, I like it. It's, it. That's what I like about this game. It's just... So original at the time. What inspired Half Life? I know you, you've got your. There's actually there is some inspiration for it. But so the, the 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 actual um, original. Well, Gabe Newell, the person that. I think there would have been big DC fans. Big DC fans, but he's apparently was inspired by a Stephen King novel. On on the any ideas? Uh, I should know this because I read all the Stephen King. Or a novella. It's going to be precise. Oh, oh. um. It's going to be hmm. hard then. <laughs> Forget the novella. Tommy Knockers. No. Not, I've um, mm, not stand. Apparently inspired by the mist. Never read that. Mm. Okay, well there you go. I haven't either, truthfully. Mm. But there you go. How did Half Life change the first person shooter landscape? I've got a few bullet points here, a few ideas. Mm. Um, Any ideas for I rattle through these? these they points? were pretty frantic before then. Like you mentioned, like yeah. Quake and Doom and yeah. Duke Nukem. They're all kind of frantic, just full was, on. Yeah, it yeah. was basically just. It was a bit like first person Smash TV. Yeah. That was that, yeah, yeah. that was first person shooters yeah. before. Yeah, I think we've kind of touched on it before. The story element. You have puzzle to, element. You have to walk around for twenty minutes before you can kill anything. Yeah, but yeah. the way they do it, you kind of you kinda of hold with it. Like even the first time I played Half Life must have been about sixteen, seventeen. And that bit you'd think the kids of today would go, What the hell is this, man? I don't wanna go outside. But it's like it's long that, but it the way it kind of just draws you in. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. That's kind of common now, though, isn't it? Yeah. You get long quite often. Get long sections yeah. of the game before you yeah. actually start controlling anything. Yeah. Again, though, as part of the story, it, you know, it, it gets you involved into the game world. Yeah, mm. I think so. These 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 are more like things that 
were introduced at Half-Life and now almost commonplace. So the, the between episode text which, which appears then sort of fades away. And that's a little thing, but that's something that mm. they bought into it, which for me is quite clever. There's a train segment at the start as well, mm. which, 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 which comes up very often now, a train segment of the game. Pretty new at the time. There's also um, blood splatters and other persistent stains. So if you, mm. if you shoot the bad guys, you can see blood appear on, on their... Mm. On, oh, okay. Yeah, do you understand yeah. that? Again, quite a new thing, actually. Um, also speech as well you can actually interact with other, other, other people and get them along helping you and talk to them well, they had different personalities quite simple personalities truthfully but again quite, quite original at the time uh, also weaponry which you need to manually reload between magazine changes you have to press the R Imagine button actually do it reload yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. exactly and yeah constant playthrough the levels directly connect to each other which, is, which I think is great Does, do you know any of the uh, the add-ons for Half-Life. Mm. Not quite. We spoke briefly about Half-Life 2, but for Half-Life 2, there's some add-ons. Never. Never. Hold on. Yeah. What about Half-Life Blue Shift? Ah. Well, no. <laughs> now, actually... I, I, Says Kev, using the, uh, well, the, the well, Dreamcast. Can I talk about it in a minute? There's one before that. Oh, yeah, sure. There's, there's two add-ons for Half-Life. The first one is Opposing Force. And that was released in 1999. And again, I, I think it's a PC game only. And you are not playing as Dr. Gordon Freeman. You are playing oh. as Adrian Shepard. Adrian! Hey. Good old Adrian Shepard. Hey. And actually, he's playing as a Marine. You're a Marine from his point of view. How cool is that? That's cool. It is so good. And you, you're, you've been sent to cover up the evidence of the incident. You have to kill the scientists. <gasps> you know, the enemy, kill the aliens. It's, it's so... You know, it just takes the game from a different angle, isn't it? Mm. It's not quite as long as Half Life. The, the original Half Life is about sort of nineteen kind of chapters as such. This has got about eleven, but not bad for the mm -hmm. price. It cost you know about twenty or quid for that. And uh, yeah, as, as Keith said, there was a, a, a blue ship <laughs> port which was supposed to be exclusive to the Dreamcast. No way, it was exclusive only for the Dreamcast. But basically, because the, the Dreamcast version was never supposed to be released. They made this this game called Blue Shift, and they thought, well, we made a game now. Let's put it on the PC. Oh, and what I like, so look, I've, I've, you, you play as a scientist. You can play as a marine. Who else haven't you played as yet? Aliens. That's not it. Oh. <laughs> I mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned one of the scientists. Well, you can argue Doctor Who. Who else can you do? Marine, who else can you use in the game? Uh, G Man. That'd be brilliant, but no, it's not the G Man. Uh, they're like security staff. Brilliant. brilliant. You play as a security guard. It's so, so great. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. And your name is Barney Calhoun. Barney, Barney. Good Calhoun. Old Barney. And he just wants to oh, be man. safe. His mission is simple. Get out of this place alive. You know, <laughs> it's simple. And it, it's so good. And, you know, I've been playing, I've been playing the uh, add-ons as well recently. They're, they're, they're just as fun as the original Half-Life. Really, really, really good. Um, also, I mentioned earlier, guys, it was released on the PS2. There was something called Half Life DK, which was another expansion. Um, Rings the bell. I don't know why. I think it's a more co I haven't played it truthfully. It's more of a cooperative gameplay element where two players can solve puzzles and fight against the many foes in the Half Life universe. Hey, not a bad little add on. Mm. I mean, that's quite nice, isn't it? Trying to add a bit more to the console games. Yeah, yeah. Why not? You know, I like that. Fans. Okay, it's not an a proper official release, but fans have made a remake of Half Life called Black Mesa in 2012 and this uses the, the latest source engine I'm talking top graphics you know it, I've yeah, played it engine. yeah I believe it I, I've, well the one they use well yeah the Counter Strike uh, yeah the yeah. most recent Counter Strike but it's really really good um, yeah uh, Valve not made by Valve but they're fully fully supported about it as well um, Half-Life 2 eventually re it was announced in 2003 released in 2004 absolutely great game okay. But I'm not going to talk about it today. We'll save that for another pod. And actually, there was a Half-Life 2 game, a Survivor game, which is a Japanese-only arcade game. Oh. And you, you control two joysticks and pedals, <laughs> and you're moving around, shooting oh, the bad guys. Oh, that sounds right up my street. I, I've looked hmm. on YouTube. It looks incredible. It looks it's a proper reaction and shooting. What's like. it called? Half-Life? Half-Life 2 Survivor. Survivor. It looks great. I'd yes. so love to play oh, that. Heart of Gaming, get one. Yeah. You know what? It does look that good. It does look <laughs> I'd love to play it. Right. A few facts now. Are you ready for this? A few bit of trivia. When they released uh, Half Life, what do you think the German version was like? What do you reckon they did to Half Life? <laughs> the German version. What, are they a fan of blood yeah. in those early, sort of late no. 90s? No, they, they wanted to censor strict. everything. Mm -hmm. So they, they turned all the human soldiers into robots. 
Uh. <laughs> if you shoot, if you shoot a scientist with a security guard, oh, they just sit on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Blood splatters from humans were coloured yellow. Um, so it looks like they've urinated up the wall. It looks like it, doesn't it? Very nice. See how polite I was then. <laughs> Right, a few more. I like this. Uh, the glue on guns entity name, so kind of almost like the sort of slang name for the gun. It was the weapon Egon, and that yeah, was yeah, reference yeah. to Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Egon. So there you go. Little there. Nice. Um, apparently, Gordon Freeman's original name was Ivan the Space Biker. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad they changed that. <laughs> and he had a beard. Ivan the Space Biker. <laughs> I think that's maybe what the, the ponies have possibly. See, there's the DC thing comes. That's basically Lobo. Lobo, <laughs> really? Lobo is like the space biker bounty hunter who's always going around fighting with Superman. I love okay. DC. The right. main man. Probably my favourite fact, actually. I should probably say it's a laugh really. My favourite fact. This is apparently one of Quentin Tarantino's favourite video games of all time. And apparently he has stated that he, he would like to one day actually make it into a film. Hmm? Do it, Quentin. We'll, <laughs> we'll run a Kickstarter. Wow. We'll, we'll chip in a fiver. I, I would love to see that. And, you know, that's high praise, isn't it? If Tarantino likes your game, I think you pretty much have done a good job. I can't yeah. imagine Tarantino working with that material that well, though. I don't know if it could transfer to a film very well because it's, it's quite solitary, a lot of jumping around, shooting. You know, I can. The storyline, even though it's a really good story, I think because you're immersed in it yourself, it's a bit different. Hey, if anyone can turn it into a good film, Tarantino, right? I think Tarantino is more of a Red Rock. Is it Red Rock Redemption? Oh yeah, Red Dead yeah. Redemption. Red, Red Dead Redemption. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, and because uh, like apparently um the guy who did District Nine, uh, Nell Blomkamp was meant to be doing a Halo game that okay. never actually film. Uh, yeah, I heard about. So that. film, yeah, yeah. It really never came to fruition. Yeah, I mean, there's some sort of half cocked Halo featurey type. Films, yeah, there's been some uh, like CG CGI ones. CGI ones. Yeah. Well. Yeah, Neil Blomkamp should, should do one. Guys, just do these films. <clears throat> Come Duncan, on. Maybe Duncan Jones, the guy who did like Moon and. Um, I love Moon. Yeah, could have done it's Half Life, film. but he's already ruined his rep with World of Warcraft. Warcraft. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you want another movie slash trivia Half Life fact? Yes, mm-hmm. yes, please. What is, or what was, I should say, a bit of a sad story, really, but what was Robin Williams' favourite video game of all time? Oh, the Zelda. Zelda. He was a Zelda, Zelda game. He's a huge Zelda fan. He, he called his daughter <clears throat> Zelda, didn't he, to be fair? Did he really? I didn't know. Yeah, that's no, no, true. No. But apparently his favourite just game on its own, I know he loves the Zelda series, obviously, but it was uh, it was Half-Life 2. So it's more of a Half-Life 2 fact, truthfully. <laughs> but I'm sure he liked Half-Life as well. That's a nice little go. fact. Oh. And apparently he was lined up uh, as, as a possible voiceover for future games, if they made a half life free, mm. he was he was apparently oh. really more than more than willing and able to be one of the voice actors. But nice. it's, I guess we'll never see that happen, unfortunately. Mm. The names in the lockers. I told you that locker scene when you first start the game. The names in the lockers are names of people who made the game. So you can go around. So there's obviously G Freeman, Gordon Freeman, and uh, yeah. So that's a little. It, no, that's great, isn't it? You'd put your name on there, wouldn't you? Uh, ah, I like this one. What? <laughs> Well, there's there's a number of security doors in the game, and one of them says security seven G. Who works in sector seven G? Oh, hey, Homer, yeah. Homer. Homer. So, <laughs> little homage, that is brilliant. Nice. Little homage to the, to the nuclear power plant Simpsons. There, Love there that. you go. Gordon Freeman says no words throughout the game ever. They no. he's a silent man, a bit like Link. Doesn't like talk. Link, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't talk. And like I said, guys, he does have a ponytail. This can be revealed in the third person mode, but. It, it, is, it has been chopped off by Half-Life 2. No! But there you go. Mm. So many awards. Mm. This game, like I said, guys, was off the charts of PC game awards. It won a ridiculous amount of awards. Um, it, it, I think, personally, it laid the groundwork for, for many, many, arguably all future first-person shooter games. It's so fun. It's so good. The, it's still playable today. Truthfully, I'm playing the sort of Half-Life Source versions. They've been upgraded graphics. So it's not quite the original, but it's. I would highly recommend it. It's dirt cheap on Steam. I, I picked up the PS2 for a pound. I saw it in the charity shop for a pound. I thought, might as well get it. Hmm. Um, I've got a dodgy version on the Dreamcast, <laughs> as, you, as you know. Which I'm now going to yeah, enjoy this evening. That, Give yeah. it a go. See what people play a bit of Opposing Force, maybe. Do you know what game actually shit, yeah. reminded me the most of when I was kind of looking at Clips is Portal? Yeah. Well, who made Portal? Is it the same? That's That's Valve, 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 yeah. 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 Do you know what? I never got into Portal. I, I, I appreciate it's the, okay yeah it wasn't a gaffle I mm-hmm. love this game but I never really got into it mm, you know? I've not tried it it doesn't 
Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Something about it. It's quite, I like I like the puzzle I'm element. Like you've stupid. got to go through this pool to get up there and go over here. Oh, he's pretty yeah, clever. It's clearly very clever. Yeah, it's mm. clever. But you know what, me and current gen games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the first portal was quite old, truth, but there you go. Yeah, I played. The, what's the one I played lately? Portal two. Portal two. Portal two. Yeah, it was alright. Right, Half Life Top, one of my favourite games of all time. And actually, it, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there, because I remember um, when my Half Life 2 disc broke my PC, no. I had to buy another Half Life 2, uh, Half Life disc, sorry, just as first Half Life. And I didn't buy it for Half Life. Why would I buy Half Life, the game again? Because uh, it broke. What? Any ideas? Because of a certain add on game. Because of a certain <laughs> mod that has now turned into a certain game that I love. <laughs> wow. Counter Strike. Boom. Counter Strike CS. Brilliant. You know, it was, I spoke earlier in the Duke episode about me playing multiplayer with Usman. <laughs> Connecting up. <laughs> it wasn't was really million. multiplayer, was it? it and actually, I didn't, I didn't mention this, but I, we had two PCs at the time, some really old, slow PC, and this half decent PC, and we used to connect. I think it was a LAN cable, the two yeah, PCs. LAN to play, party. To play Doom. To play Doom multiplayer. And to make, to make the, the, one of the Doom games work on the old PC, we had to put the screen down to the smallest bit. So it's almost like a match <laughs> A little size. window in there. Honestly, it's the only way to play the game. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So I, I was getting into this mode, I thought, oh, first person shooters. But Counter Strike was probably the first first person shooter game that, that, that really, really properly introduced me to, to online play. Absolutely. I still play it today. I'm not very good at the game. Um, it was co created by a certain Ming Li. His, his nickname is Gooseman. <laughs> and he's very kindly given a, a nice interview on Arcade Attack so yeah, please yeah. Yeah, check it out listeners go and have a look at the website yeah, yeah. it's it's a game um, I think it was first sort of developed in 1999 it's um, a very simple game really in a way in a nutshell you, you, you're either in one of two teams terrorists or counter terrorists and it's quite a simple uh, sort of mission as such whoever survives wins does that make sense so if you're on the, obviously if you're in the counter terrorist, you've got to take up terrorists and vice versa. But there's also hostages you might have to save. There's also bombs you might have to plant or defuse, depending on what team you're on, obviously. And it's it's quick, it's fast. It, it, you can play each level lasts about five minutes. So I, I die quite soon. I was, <laughs> obviously, you can watch who will play what's happening, but I play straight again. And it's one of those games where. I must have put hours in. Me and my brothers put hours and hours. And I hours remember in. playing that around your house yeah. when we were about seventeen, eighteen. It's an addictive little number. And I remember trying it. Uh, yep, yeah, died. Okay, <laughs> respawn. Uh, no, 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 okay, just give up. But yeah, yeah, it was very impressive. Very impressive. And actually, it's one of those games where if you don't play it for a while, you get very bad at it quickly. You have to keep <laughs> playing it. Um, it was initially made as a mod for Half Life, and it was, de- it was designed by Ming Li and Jess Cliff Cliff. Apparently, that's his nickname, Cliff. Um, but actually when they were making this mod it became ridiculously popular and Valve they saw how good this game was and they Valve they could have got a bit snooty couldn't they about it but they said no we like what you're doing how can we help and they helped develop this extra add-on this additional game Um, and you read the interview but basically uh, Ming was making this game in his last year of university and he basically admitted that his grades suffered because of it. <laughs> you imagine? I think he's made a few more quid than he would have done through anything through uni, so I think he's all right. I think he's done all right, hasn't he? Yeah. So, it was, sorry. I was going to ask, like, which country was this going on in? Because I know, like, I remember, I think Count Strike got super popular in Korea. I think I you're think, right. First of all. I think you're right. I think it's, it's, it's huge around the world. I know it's, well, I'll talk about the esports scene later. But it's so popular around the world. Uh, so it was first sort of developed in 1999. It got its proper release in 2000, the proper finished caboodle. And you know, later it was available on the Xbox, believe it or not. How cool was that? How cool was that? Um, there was a few follow-ups as well. Counter-Strike Condition Zero. That was made by Turtle Rock Studios. I don't think that was particularly good. Later the same year, Counter-Strike Source came out, and that's obviously the sort of upgraded graphics, same game, slightly more refined. Um, really, really top, top-notch. And the most recent version, the fourth sort of game in the series, is Counter Strike Global Offensive, and it's it's really quite a polished game. When did that come out? Two thousand and twelve. Okay. And again, that's also available on Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty. And that is, I know you said you're going to talk about it, but that is still what they're playing yeah. the esports tournaments. Oh, the uh, yeah. around the world, amazing. So yeah, Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, PS Three, and obviously Steam via Windows. Mm. Brilliant game. I I've got it now. I, I, 
I'm so bad at it now, though. Mm-hmm. I, I, I die straight away. And, you know, it's, it is so, so good. And people have made spin-off versions of Counter-Strike. I remember playing, like, a, a Simpsons level, and they, someone had changed all, all the, the builds <laughs> to Simpsons levels. And I think someone developed this kind of Warcraft strategy game where you could sort of level up throughout the game and get mm-hmm. special magic powers. Mm-hmm. And it's... Peter's the mod scene was huge, and this is arguably the most important mod game of the PC generation. You could argue it's so popular even today. Um, Twenty five million copies have been sold of this game. Twenty five wow, million. Was that? You know, it's massive. Apparently, it's one of the biggest games on Twitch. We, we're not Twitch, it's people mm, watching. Yeah, yeah streaming. They live streaming. It is. It is still one of the most played games on Steam. You know, mm. and there is some ridiculously. I'm talking stupendously competitive scene for the esports. Yeah. Some of these, they're making huge money. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's their jobs. Mm-hmm. I've seen it, and they, 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 they have their little team, and they sit in a bedroom somewhere mm. practicing for like twelve hours a day. Mm. They wake up, they play. Yeah, oh, they go to sleep. But then they go to the play the and then they win big money. I'm not going to say any names, but I emailed a few of them. I thought it'd be nice to get an interview. It's too busy. Mm. Too busy. Too busy. Too busy. Too busy. Like, whoa, these guys are serious. Yeah. <laughs> There's some great maps in the game, Aztec, Dust, Inferno, some infamous maps. You know, there's, it's brilliant. And what I like about it is it's always quite fair as well. No one's got the big advantage. You have to sort of work as a team. I used to like, as I wasn't particularly good at the game, I used to kind of just uh, walk just behind one of my friends and uh, <laughs> if he got shot, <laughs> I'd hope he'd dodge behind him and shoot the bad guy. Nice. Um, obviously, you have to be very, headshots, all about headshots in Counter-Strike as well. You have to be very careful about that and the recoil as well. So addictive. I'm not playing Counter Strike with you. Um, like I said, I, I used to be good back in the day, but not no way as good as I used to be. Weapons are great as well. There's knives, AK 47s, automatic rifles, snipers. You know, people camping out and stuff that does happen. Um, it is easy to pick up and play, but very hard to to become brilliant and to become a, a legendary esports player, CS player. Must take years to get that good. Um, Ming Lee was voted by IGN as one of the, the top 100 most important game developers of all time. You know, this, wow. this guy at uni that was developing this game on the side, he is regarded as, well, he's up there. Him and his mate Cliff create such, a, such an iconic game. Do you want to hear some facts slash a bit of controversy? Because I'm a fan of Counter-Strike, but it has had a bit of controversy over the years. You ready for this? Mm-hmm. One gamer, I think a French gamer, got so mad in the online game of Counter Strike uh, with a virtual knife fight. He, he, he lost the virtual knife fight. That he he found out the person that killed him on the game and actually stalked him in real life. It took him six months around to stalk him and actually stabbed him. Oh yeah. man! Like, so sad. So, uh, luckily, the man survived. It, apparently, it was like an inch away from his heart. <clears> but this guy's in jail now. But oh, the, the, the amount some of anger! Crazy people out there. No. Um, another. Quite controversial story is uh, an American gamer, American student, actually designed his school in a Counter Strike map. Oh. <laughs> so it wasn't probably the best idea, and no. things have been happening already. That's poor taste. Poor, he was excluded. I think it was more worried that it might be a practice simulation. Well, yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, don't don't do that, guys. Feel free to make maps, but we wouldn't recommend that. No, no. Um, match fixing. Apparently, no. Yeah. Apparently, some esports teams God. have been accused of taking money to play rubbish in follow up matches. Oh, what? yeah, real, and actually, it's, apparently, it's been proven, and large amounts of money have been thrown around on this. How crazy is that? Mm-hmm. And if, I suppose uh, it's quite hard to prove, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. I suppose it would be. Drug testing. Apparently, some some people are so good that uh, uh, opponents have accused them of having, having steroids and so forth playing the game. <laughs> you know, how ridiculous is that? So Are you not allowed steroids in esports? Well, surely no. it's less steroids and more stuff like I, Ritalin I, type Ritalin, yeah, so yeah, like yeah. make you focus. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not steroids. Yeah, I think it's more sort of well, alertness and whatever. Mm. Right, this is probably my favourite fact of Counter Strike. Have you heard of a football player called Stuart Holden? Yeah, yeah. Bolton. Pepper Bolton. <laughs> yeah, American guy. Yeah, American. He's a retired professional footballer. He's quite a big TV sports uh, pundit now on Fox News. Mm. He played for Bolton, Sheffield Wednesday, and Houston Dynamo. But apparently, before his soccer career, 
he was a professional Counter-Strike player. <laughs> I did not know wow. that. He's a cool bloke. And apparently, um, I think that fact has been proven, but he doesn't like it. So if you put it on Wikipedia, if you've deleted it, <laughs> so, I think mean, there's good evidence. Uh, why? I don't think, again, I'm, I'm not completely sure, but I'm pretty sure that is a, a real fact, but he's not proud of that that fast. Why, why would you not be proud? Stop deleting it, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love you, it's okay. And I think Rob would like this fact the best. <laughs> in, in Sweden, McDonald's actually changed their name on their burgers um, for, for, after their country's CS team, uh, I think it was for Ninjas in Pajamas, this big, big esports uh, Counter Strike team, to the McNip Burger. Ninjas in Pajamas, McNip. Would you order a McNip from McDonald's? <laughs> Sounds a bit racist. <laughs> well, I'm sure it wasn't supposed to be. Uh, moving um, on swiftly. I mean, like, you know, like, because I've spent, I've been in Australia a while. Obviously, they call Burger King Hungry Jacks over there. Mm. But I think they don't call McDonald's McDonald's there anymore. Oh, really? They call it Maccas. <laughs> Maccas. They've actually changed Maccas. the name of it. Maccas. Maccas. I know. The, I don't mind Hungry Jacks. Anyway. Good old, and we, we've mentioned Ming Lee as well. He's, he's, he's partner in crime. Good old Jeff Cliff. Um, I think because the budgets were quite low when they first made the game, he also did all the recorded radio commands. So if you play Counter Strike, I'm sure people go, "Well, we'll, we'll recognise these and things like the bomb has been defused," or "Go, go, go," or "Okay, let's go." So he actually recorded his voice, and I think only recently they've they've changed the, the voices in in <laughs> Counter Strike. So. Why did they change them? Uh, yeah, they try to make fools. it. I think they try to make it a little bit more kind of what group you're on, different sort of okay. accents and so forth. Look, Counter Strike. I, I know it's, it's it started in 2000. It's developed over time. It's worth checking out. If you want a quick game, a multiplayer game, a bit of fun, uh, you can't really go wrong with Counter Strike, but there you go. Are the recent ones only available on PC? Uh, I believe, no, it's on the PS3 and Xbox 360. Oh, really? I think, yeah, I believe, yeah. Okay. The, the, the like what, I mean, I'm not really, I've never been a big first person shooter gamer. Yeah. Um, I pl- the only one I really played and enjoyed was Call of Duty Modern Warfare, like right. a lot of people. And the older, older like Medal of Honor games, oh, yes, PS2 sure. era stuff. Um, what set, having never played it, what sets Counter Strike apart from like a recent Call of Duty? I think why it's... why do they still play a five year old game in esports rather than like the latest Call of Duty? Do you know what I think? Because they update the game often. Yeah, yeah. They always obviously there's new versions, but they often have updates. And the mod scene on the side is huge. People always develop new maps, and I think it's just. A simple, all-round addictive game where any Tom, Dick, or Harry can play it and get their head around it, but you want to get good at it. And you and what I like about it is you, it's like a league table. So once you get a few a few kills, you go up and you think, oh, that's pretty good. And all of a sudden, you go to a new map and like, oh, that's interesting. And it gets really quite competitive. And I, I'm not really a fan of modern warfare games, truthfully. It's not mm. really my cup of tea. But I suppose Counter Strike is very similar. I just think it's a little bit more. Just more playable, a bit simpler. You just pick up a gun, run around, work as a team, and every every level's different. You, you, if you die, you play the same map again, let's say, but it always feels a bit different. I'll go in that direction. Why don't I go this way? This guy's got... Do you understand? There's always different ways to, 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 to play the maps. and I I just think it's nostalgia for me as well. I remember going, yeah. oh, I remember playing this game, back in the, this map back in 2000. It's a bit more updated now, a bit smoother, but it brings back good memories for me. Yeah, definitely, definitely worth checking out. Cool. So yeah, guys, I hope you enjoyed that Half-Life, Counter-Strike, two two top PC games for me. I'm sure we can all agree it's helped pave the way for future games. And uh, I'll speak to you soon.
thanks for listening to today's podcast we really hope you enjoyed it if you want to get in touch regarding this week's episode or anything else you can tweet us at arcade attack uk at keith barlow 82 and at arcade underscore adriano we're also on facebook at facebook.com slash arcade attack uk please check out our website at arcadeattack.co.uk for lots of retro gaming goodness interviews reviews features top 10s etc and you can also find all our previous podcasts there our podcasts are available to stream from the website and from soundcloud and are available to download for free from stitcher podbean and itunes where you can also leave us a review and a rating which we would really really appreciate so until next time take care and we'll speak to you soon